So uh, this is a kind of like a, 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 I tailored the content more on like the tutorial base. So it's like introduction, uh, introductory level talk on a synchrotron uh, technique, uh, which is called excited optical luminescence, and uh, combine this zeal with uh, uh, the other synchrotron technique that uh, more people are familiar with, which is after absorption near structures, dense, and they use these two combined techniques to study uh, the luminescence uh, materials. So this is the focus of this talk is about light emitting materials. So it's just a very quick overview of how the light is produced. Um, so once you have a material and the ground state that is not, not light emitting, and then uh, once there is some external energy source coming in, and then this ground state of the material will become excited. And during the excitation, this energy that the material absorbed has to be rele released in some sort of form. So in this case, you are looking at the material that released the energy in the form of photon, so like light emission. So this external energy can be provided in different ways, uh, so which brings in different kind of uh, luminescence. So it could be chemiluminescence, which is the luminescence generated by redox potential, or electroluminescence, so this is by providing external current or by electron impact as the cathodal luminescence. And also, the last one is the one that I'm going to focus on. This is the, the external energy is light. So it's the photon that is absorbed and then released in the form of photon. So that's the photoluminescence, it's a photon in, photon out technique. So speaking of luminescence, then the mechanism, like the reason the material could luminescent is they go through some electronic transition process. So the fundamentals could be like when we're talking about the organic molecules, then the famous Jablonski diagram uh, shown here. And then, so this is what people are dealing with, the so electron transition, so like the, um, either through fluorescence or phosphorescence, that's the process that gives off photons. Or if you talk about semiconductors, then instead of having molecular levels, then you have the band structure. So you have the incoming photon that excites the energy, it excites the electrons from valence band to conduction band to create a electron hole pair, and then it would combine to give off luminescence. And sometimes if a semiconductor is very structure defect or um, like donor states or acceptor states, and then the photon emitted, in this case, it will be slightly less than the energy of the band gap. So if it's in this case, then it will be similar. And if there are impurities in the donor state, effect of acceptor state, then it will have, uh, the photon energy will be uh, smaller than the band gap. And sometimes when you have an even more complicated case is that when you combine these two pictures together, is that when you have a semiconductor with impurities like with dopant or color centers, so they're talking about electronic transition, uh, recombination between conduction band and uh, valence band, and then there's tr electronic transfer involving this molecular like levels. So luminescence can be quite complicated. So we want to understand the, like which electron, trans, which transition processes give off the, uh, the luminescence. And in the materials, like if you have a material mixture, um, then what is the ingredient? What is the composition of the material that is giving off luminescence? So based on this picture, I bring this most complicated case here. So uh, in order to produce luminescence, the excitation source needs to have the energy higher than whatever photon that is emitted. So in this case, since we're talking about the visible luminescence, so then uh, if the photon energy is high enough to like go beyond visible, so in most cases, it's a UV light should be sufficient. So this is why um, like photoluminescence spectroscopy is quite common. It can be set up in a lab. So you just bring in a UV source 
and then it, the energy is sufficient to promote a homolomal transition or valence electron to conduct valence band to conducting band transition. That you will see the luminescence. Then here's the question. So if UV is already sufficient to produce a light emitting process, then why we need to bother with X-ray excitation, right? So this is the X-ray excited optical luminescence, like why bother, right? So the, the X-ray, using X-ray as excitation source, so zero, is looking at the luminescence generated by a slightly different process. So the key difference is actually the excitation, the, the electrons that are being excited is different. Using UV source, uh, the excitation is valence band or the homo electrons. But using zeal, you're able to go into the higher energy so that you have the energy high enough to excite the core electron. So in this case, so once the core electron is excited, and then you're looking at several de excitation processes. For example, here you have the OJ process, you have an electron going from the shallow level, and then to fill this core hole and leaving a hole at a shallow level, like an upper level. And then this energy is released and then could be reabsorbed by another electron and then to kick out into the conduction band. So there's another hole left behind. So this the OJ process. So as this process going on could continue, right? And then this hole originally started at the deep down core level could get could be brought up all the way to the top of the valence band. So during one excitation, you bring the core hole up to this valence band hole so that this is this process is initiated by this core electron excitation. Ultimately, you have the recombination between the conduction band and valence band electron. So similar to the UV excitation. But the only difference is that, so although you might see the same outcome, you see the same color of the light, but the production of this electron hole pair, the mechanism is different. And how different is that? Is that this generation of the whole pair is linked to the excitation of a particular core electron. So the so this is linked to the absorption process, so, which means that if the zeal is collected during an excitation process, the core electron excitation process, then the luminescence that you detected could be related to that particular element or the particular ed edge energy that you're excited or the particular site. So it's like you're looking at a localized so the luminescence from a localized, from a specific channel. So that's the difference. So I'll, I'll talk about the example, like how to do this. So the zeal is usually done with the zen. So this is the typical setup for zens in a yield spectral form. So it could be uh, acquiring a, the fluorescence yield or the total electron yield by looking at the fluorescence, X-ray fluorescence from the sample or electrons from the sample. And then these two, one is bulk sensitive, the other is surface sensitive. So I'm showing example, quick example for titanium oxide. So for example, if we have this type of structure, the titanium dioxide nanotube grow on a piece of substrate, titanium substrate. And by doing a typical near edge spectrum, at titanium LH, we will see the TUI the electron yield and the fluorescence yield showing all these fine features that belong to this region, that's a titanium oxide. And then the fluorescence yield is a bit more bulk sensitive, so you'll see a little bit of titanium substrate. So this is the typical absorption spectra uh, when you acquire uh, on the sample like this. And for zeal, what you, on you only need to do is to add a spectrometer that could collect the optical photons, right? So it's additional attachment. So by while doing zins, you can collect the zeal at the same time. So zeal could be collected in two ways. One is to measure the luminescence spectra at a particular excitation energy. So this is 
the spectra on the left, bottom left, is a, a several zeal spectra. So it marks the same sample, same sample, uh, titanium oxide grow on titanium, uh, zeal collected at different energies. So the energy selection, um, you can choose whatever energy that you like. Since you're at a synchrotron, you can choose any energy at this range. And then you can see at a particular energy, you can acquire a optical spectra. At, so this uh, x-axis is wavelength and that uh, y is the intensity similar to the UV, the, fu uh, the fluorescence measurement, the PL measurement in the lab, that you have an optical spectrum. At the same time, instead of collecting several spectrum at several selected energies, you can continuously counting the photon, the number of photons emitted, either total photon or you can define a range, the photon of a particular wavelength. And you can add up all these numbers of photons as a yield spectrum. And while you scan the excitation energy, you get, you count the total photon at a particular energy from the sample, emitted from the sample, so that you can get so-called the optical yield spectra. So this is what they call the PLY, photoluminescence yield, similar to FY, similar to TEY, other than the difference is the yield that you're counting is different. So FY counting fluorescence yield, TUY you're counting electron yield. Here you're simply counting the optical yield. So this, in this case, so you see the titanium oxide is light emitting. This figure does not tell you which wavelength it is light emitting. It only tells you it is giving off light. The number of photon emitted across this absorption energy tracks as a similar profile of the TY or the F or FY. All right. So from this feature, if you have a complicated material and then different element, well, might might have different response when the certain absorption edge you are looking at might have the different behavior. This is how to correlate the, the luminescence with the absorption profile. So this is just a general introduction. So next I'm going to talk about some examples. So I'd like to pause here and then in case uh, for some questions before I go into the case, case study. Thank you. It's great to have that, uh, that background material. Um, one question for you. In the model you had for the core hole propagating uh, mm -hmm. uh, up into the, uh, the valence band, um, mm -hmm. uh, there's an assumption there of a really strong locality. Um, yes. Is it indeed the case that you more generally get light from the actual atom where the 1S has occurred? Or is it possible that you excite some cascade of, uh, uh, of local phenomena? and the emitted light is not so local. So yeah, so this, the, the zeal process um, is quite complicated. So what I was talking about, I try to keep it simple because I only have 30 minutes. So I'm talking about <laughs> really the, the ideal case, right? If it's local, um, then we're just looking at the emission just from that process. In the actual cases, there are numerous processes that are going on at the same time, so which makes this so complicated. So I'm talking about the, the ideal case. So the conclusion that I made is just that there is some connection. You can build some connections. But in terms of quantitative measure, quantitative analysis, uh, you need to think really careful about the system. Very good. There's a, uh, a question about how sensitive the luminescence setup needs to be. Can you say something about that? Uh, based on my experience, it's depending on the spectrometer, the sen the, like how sensitive the spectrometer is. So um, normally, if you can visually see the sample is light emitting under an X-ray, the spectrometer can definitely pick up that uh, signal. Uh, but if you want to detect something that is so weak, then uh, you might need really, really long acquisition time or really align all optics. So yeah, I would suggest the, uh, like the zeal, especially if you want to continuously count the photon, like do the PLY, uh, the sample has to be bright enough. 
to do that. Okay. Um, uh, I assume you're just doing optical fiber coupling off to a, uh, a optical spectrometer is somewhere else. Yeah. No, so. yeah, this is yeah, this is normally the case. Okay. Um, there's a, if you go back to your spectrum that had the titanium. Sure. There's a question about why does the. Sorry, I, um, I lost the question. Uh, why do we see a peak in the zeal spectrum below the titanium K edge? The zeal. Yeah, it's L edge, but the thing that's minor. Sorry. So you, Sorry. you mean this thing? Yes. So this is actually, you can. Oh, it does line that's, up. That's, that's, that does line up. That's okay. the, the forbidden 1S2, one, 3D one transition. Very good. Um, I think uh, uh, a lot of these other questions, there's a few more, are going to be, uh, uh, we'll be able to address them better as you get into the examples. So yeah. why don't you continue and thank you. Okay. So I'll talk about the uh, four cases. So still, be, I'll keep it simple. Uh, just keep in mind, things might be really going to get like complicated down to a specific sample system. So what I have picked are the ideal cases. All right. So. I don't want to make this technique too scary to the people who haven't heard of it. So the so first a good example, I really like it, is the nanostructure silicon. So silicon, bulk silicon, indirect semiconductor, not light emitting, are not supposed to, but if you make it down to nano, uh, it is luminescent. So the first case is the porous silicon, which is Basically, you etch the surface of silicon wafer to make it porous, so the surface will have like nano structured silicon, and it is orange. So if you shine a light on it, it's, it gives off orange light. So the question is, it is because of the nano silicon, the quantum confinement, or is simply uh, uh, the native oxide layer, so which is the insulator. You have very you have many defects in there that happen to have a, an uh, emission, uh, optical emission at that wavelength, all right? So, so this is a very old study, um, done in the 90s. So uh, comparing uh, porous silicon and with a um, molecular silicon, it's a cytosine. So the bottom three are porous silicon. So it has the orange light emission detected using these three energies. And then the silocene also some light emitting uh, peaks at different wavelengths and three different uh, excitation energies. So the first observation here is that the intensity is different, right? So at, if you look at particular, like just focus on porous silicon here, uh, as the, the incoming light, the energy changes, the intensity changes. And it does not always follow the higher energy, higher intensity. So this is the interesting thing. So here you can see it, the energy, the intensity of uh, porous silicon at 1840 is the strongest. And if you go above that energy, it drops a bit, right? So this is better way of looking at the photoluminescence yield spectra so that the cell scene, if you just track the intensity change, like count the total amount of photons, that you can see that the luminescence yield spectra tracks the silicon, like follows the silicon dioxide part, right? Once this is absorption is higher and then this uh, full of, uh, luminescence is higher. But for porous silicon, it's very interesting that although the TUI, the yield spectra, the electron yield shows that it has both elemental silicon and also the silicon dioxide, but in the yield, the, the optical spectra, you only see a positive response to elemental silicon, but not, not oxide silicon. So this is a good evidence showing that the orange emission from the porous silicon is more likely from the elemental silicon. A similar example is that when you have a mixture. So this is the chain like silicon silicon dioxide nanowires. So you see this round 
this joint. So that's silicon dioxide and this wire is more silicon. So uh, A and B here is the zeal of this particular sample. And C and D just a, a comparison of a typical uh, pure silicon oxide, the silicon nanowire. Anyway, focus on A and B, and then you can see that it also has different uh, response at different energies, different excitation energy. And the absorption spectra shows that it contains both silicon and silicon dioxide. And if you just zoom, like collect this 460 nanometer emission, if you just look at the photon of this wavelength window, and then you see that it is basically purely solely from silicon dioxide. But if you count all the photons, including this shoulder feature 530, and then you see this a little bit of silicon, elemental silicon here. So the conclusion from this study shows that even though from, if you just do a simple PL measurement, you get two peaks, but you don't know where these two peaks are from. By using ZEO, at least you can be confident that the 460 is of a pure oxide feature. Uh, 530, um, not entirely sure, but it's definitely a mixture. So it, at least the 530 has the elemental silicon contribution. So this is the example of uh, addressing the uh, origin of the luminescence from a controversy material that could be quantum confinement, it could be oxide impurity. And the second example I'm talking about is um, the presence of impurities. So this is a boron nitride nanotube. So this is boron nitrogen sp2 hybridized forming a tubular structure, just like carbon nanotube. Uh, but instead of a pure boron nitrite, uh, some of the nitrogen is, is replaced by oxygen. So we have this oxygen impurity in there. From absorption, it clearly shows that it contains both the uh, boron nitride feature and also the boron oxygen feature. And then by doing a zero at one particular energy, all the information that you can get here is, okay, a luminescence. So it has this deep um, blue, um, purple light. And then you can see the contribution. So how these three elements are contribute to this luminescence band. And you, you can look at three edges, the boron, nitrogen, and oxygen, respectively. And then you can see that the optical yield especially this boron is quite interesting that when you hit the boron nitrogen edge, it goes up. And when you hit the boron oxygen component, it drops down. And similarly, like the nitrogen part, only have the boron nitrogen, boron nitride, nitrogen, boron nitride. So the nitrogen KH, it goes up, but the oxygen, the trend goes down. So, so the conclusion from here is that by introducing this oxygen impurity, the decay from this boron oxygen channel is not, does not prefer the optical decay, while the boron nitride, the boron nitrogen channel, prefers the decay in the optical way. And the third case is titanium oxide. We have a mixed phase. So Titanium oxide, this study um, focused on the phase transformation. So titanium oxide has two stable phases, anatase and glutile, but anatase can convert to glutile if you heat it up at several hundred Celsius. So this material I'm showing here is a interesting structure that has partially nanotubes. So this is nanotubes. And on top of that, it is small, uh, very, very small uh, wire-like structures. It's very densely packed. So call it nanograss. In the bottom is nanotube and confirmed by this SEM image. So the side is tube, you can see. And then the bottom, so this is the tube, the bottom of the tube, closed in the tube. So with this type of structure, and then we anneal it and uh, look 
at uh, and find this interesting behavior of this sample so that it has two bands. So one is the visible light and the other is near IR. So these two bands correspond to different phase. So the visible light is in the case and in the IR, it belongs to root tile. So to make this more clear, I plot, I draw this cartoon so that you have this uh, hierarchical structure with the nanograss on top of tube. So at 550, you have this annotase top and the annotase bottom. And then at 850, and the bottom convert to root tile, but the top still stays as annotase. And the, um, up on to 900 degree, and both structures convert to root tile. So this 850 is quite interesting that you have two different phases and then we can analyze separately by looking at the top and looking at the bottom. So for the, uh, the top, the grass, um, and it, uh, look, let's look at the absorption first. So it clearly shows that the root tile and the annotase has the difference here. So the peak, this part higher means it is annotase and this peak higher which is the root tile phase, right? So the two have different structures. And then the, in, the luminescence is also interesting in a way that if you count all the photons for the grass, so it mostly, it mostly coming from the visible range. So it is, um, if you read, so this is the green, so the, this curve. So it's mostly the visible range. There's a little bit of uh, root tile shows up. So if you have a little bit of root tile, right, so you can still kind of see it's the negative, it's the inversion, uh, inverted trend, but for the annotase, it's the positive. And then for the tube, you know that we know that it's mostly root tile. Right? It's still a little bit, like the, the dark blue curve here is a little bit of visible. So you can still see that the, visib uh, the visible range, the light going uh, response is positive. And for the root tile, the majority phase, the root tile phase is the negative, inverted, right? So this tells us that the optical decay uh, for annotase and a root tile are different. So the absorption of annotase core electrons, so that particular channel favors the optical decay, but for the root tile, it's the vice versa. So for mixed structure, you can still track the behavior, the optical response of this sample. And then to further use that as evidence to uh, study the actual decay process. And the last example uh, I'm here showing is a doped structure, right? So before we're talking about the impurity, like more like a mixed, comp mixed composition. So here is the, a doped structure. Uh, so it's a doped perovskite. Uh, which has its crystal structure like this. And uh, this dark blue, which is the lead. So if it's just pure lead, so this blue curve, it is a uh, uh, weak light emitting blue solution. And once you replace the lead with manganese, and it's changed from a blue to a very bright light emitting orange yellow solution because of this manganese DD transition here. So this is a very interesting observation and we'll try to figure out uh, the electron transfer during this process. So what we did is we compared two samples. One is non-doped and the, one, the other is doped with 3.5%. So um, we're clear uh, two bands. The doped sample has a blue band, has an orange band. And then we select the, the manganese edge, so magnesium L edge and just, uh, at different energies. And we see some intensity change. So we, so this is the case that we don't have a very bright light emitting sample because it's nanocrystals. So the amount is small. So the concentration is low. So we, uh, we couldn't collect enough, like bright enough signal to do a continuous PLY scan. So we only being able to select certain energies and then just to track the change the, the change in the intensity. So we, we plot the intensity change as a function 
of excitation energy, we see that both the blue band and the orange band shows a decrease once the absorption of 2p, magnus 2p happened. And that a further analysis is that this blue band can be deconvoluted into two subband. And then if you monitor these two bands, the behavior of these two bands closely, you will see that the one emission is basically not sensitive to the excitation energy, while the other decreases as the energy once it hits the absorption. So it's similar to this orange. So from this analysis, we can tell that at least for this uh, doped perovskite, there are three luminescence luminescence channels, right? In the blue, there are two components. One is excitation energy independent, the other is depending on what energy you're looking at. And in the orange, like the orange band is excitation energy dependent. So this probably need some time to explain. Uh, so this is compare the, um, the electronic transition process below the edge and above the edge. So the difference below and above the manganese edge is who took the most incoming photon, right? So below the edge, we're assuming like everything is absorbing, like a lot, all the electrons are absorbing, uh, well, all the electrons above that uh, manganese 2P, they're absorbing light, they're absorbing photons. So it's basically a constant background, constant transition, right? So looking at the energy transfer that finally down to this manganese band and then the, the perovskite band. So pro, the blue emission is related to the perovskite band gap. And this orange emission is the additional band that is introduced by introducing the manganese. So this is below. And once at the absorption edge, the incoming photon will have a redistribution. So now manganese takes most of the photons to make the transition local, uh, like particular to this site, this element. So once this transition happens, what we see is that we don't, we see a drop of this band. We see a drop of one of this perovskite band. So this means that the manganese channel is not responsible. So it does not facilitate an efficient manganese emission. So in other way is that the manganese, you cannot just directly promote the electron from the manganese 2P to this particular manganese related energy level. So this is a, uh, you have to, so this has to go through a lead up to valence to conduction and then this energy transfer has to start from the conduction band. So this is kind of the evidence proving the electron transfer process of this doped uh, material. All right, so uh, here are the examples uh, and then this will be my second pause and I'll, uh, just a very little material left. Um, oh, okay. So yeah, there's definitely questions. Excellent. I know. I know. Um, so let me, I uh, wrote them down. Here we go. I need my glasses to be able to read it. Okay. Uh, first one is, what's the typical uh, measurement time to get an XEOL spectrum at one photon energy? Uh, so depends, depending on whether the material is bright enough. So if it's bright, uh, bright means you can see it. You can see it, uh, and uh, I would say 30 seconds, you get a good, good result. And for the ones that are weak, so you, like, you really have to look at the screen to try to find the light spot. Uh, you can go up to two minutes. Uh, okay. Beyond that, uh, you're increasing the noise ratio as well. So. I see, I see. Okay, good. Um, has there been much work to try to combine zeal with Stixum? Yes, there is. Uh, there is work on that, but the tricky thing is the intensity of the light, right? This is very. This is something that uh, people are trying to achieve, but uh, for as soft X-ray, the sticks um, everything brings too close to to each other, so that 
uh, it's very difficult to jam in another optical lens to collect the emission from a single nanostructure. So it's tricky, but it is being done. Okay, very good. Um, there's uh, uh, some questions. I'll, I'll try to paraphrase the discussion and just let you comment on it. Um, okay. We're trying to understand, uh, for example, the relationship between Zeol and RICS. Um, mm -hmm. uh, or more generally, the extent to which zeol is resonant or non-resonant. And I think that might tie in with uh, uh, one of those examples you just gave. Would you like to talk on that topic? So the zeol and uh, RICS. So the, uh, I only know a little bit of RICS, honestly. So, so, uh, so, the, uh, so RICS is uh, looking at the emission of uh, uh, fluorescence, uh, extra fluorescence uh, photon. So I would say similar, uh, but uh, but zeal uh, process is a slightly more complicated. Well, the let's, let me rephrase it. So the resonance phenomena is the same. So you're looking at the uh, optical process that uh, adds that particular, like associate with this particular core electron transition. Um, but uh, since this, the luminescence, the optical, the zeal uh, happens, established based on the availability of creation of holes at the valence band and the conduction band. So whether or not you were able to, they, will, they were able to have these secondary electrons to give you these holes on top uh, is tricky. It depending on materials, depending on the, the uniformity of the sample, depending on the sample thickness. Uh, so I think that is uh, the difference between the zeo and the, mm -hmm. the RICS. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Um, uh, what roughly is the status of theory needed to help with interpretation of the results? Or can it be mostly phenomenological? Mm, very good question. Uh, I I think uh, right now, um, right now, unfortunately, most studies are um, just by looking at it and uh, making assumptions or making a qualitative comparison. Uh, the theory is definitely highly desirable for a uh, better understanding of the actual processes going on. So um, I would say uh, right now there are not that much theory to quantify or to predict the zeal process, or even just to explain the spectrum, uh, should be done. Like it's, it's kind of like a future work. I see, okay. Um, okay, uh, then why don't we let you continue and I'm sure there'll be more questions at the end. Okay, so uh, this is basically my last slide, although it's had different parts. All right, so the zeal, what I just talked about is just the uh, first generation application of zeal. So um, you acquire uh, zines and then you acquire optical signals and then you combine them and analyze what happens with your sample. So, uh, so synchrotron technology is developing. So there are advanced uh, applications of zeal. So the more things you can do with zeal. So the first, is that you can do a 2D instead of uh, a line spectra, right? So this is like you have a camera that uh, you can get the same uh, excitation energy and get one full spectra at every single excitation energy. So at the end, you will have a wavelength domain and the energy domain. So you can pull the information, similar information though. So if you do, you look, uh, the vertical cut is the wavelength, and you do the horizontal cut, it will be the yield spectra. So this is a 2D mapping, give you more information. And you can also time resolved. So time resolved, this is the old study. You know, this is tricky, because the time resolved, you really have to have really bright samples. So if you have a good sample, then it's good. So this time resolved study shows that uh, you can use different time gate and to time the different uh, time the different luminescence. So the ungated one, you see that it has different time structures 
And then just by looking at this particular the, the yield spectra of particular gate, time gated uh, behavior, you will see the difference. So it's able to distinguish the different time, uh, different luminance of different lifetime, and how that lifetime, how that particular contribution uh, to the total luminescence. So you see this, uh, the ungated, uh, so for this one, so only this very short, fast decay that follows the TY, but the long decay does not, right? So it has a clear difference. And of course, if the sample is good, you can do optical XFs. We know the normal XF is already tricky enough, but in principle, you can do optical XFs. So this authors, uh, 2019, they did XF, the zeal XFs. This is so, so the top three are the traditional transmission mode XFs. And then same sample, they're just looking at the optical. And then they can, they manage to do the, op, to pull the optical signal and then do the XFs analysis. So these two are these two. So you can see there are some differences. So they did some analysis on that. Doable, and this will be more even, uh, even uh, this will pro provide the structure information, the quantitative structural information on a sample, the luminescence, luminescence down to a particular structure, right? And um, as, uh, the question that uh, has been brought up, like the microscopy which is also doable. So right now, a uh, hard X-ray uh, has been realized with uh, this zero spectra. So this is, as you can see, it's five microns. So beam size is still fairly big, but uh, looking at a single nanowire, zinc oxide nanowire, so you see the two different spots, you can get two different emission. So yeah, so this is the, uh, together with, uh, the advanced uh, development at synchrotron station and also uh, the detection, um, the like improvement of the detection. So then it has more opportunity opens up for this zero technique. All right, so that basically uh, end uh, my talk. So the take home message is that, so this zero uh, process in combined with the absorption process could be uh, element and site and edge specific. So you can use that to identify the luminescent species in the material with a mixed structure or the, the dopant or the impurity. So I didn't talk about rare earth doped structure. So the study, zero study on that particular field is, um, there are several people doing that, uh, but I find that uh, that's not, uh, I didn't really study much on that, quite, quite, uh, quite complicated. So I left that part of, uh, aside, but it can be done on dopant rare earth luminescence. Um, and also to uh, provide you with the future opportunity of using zeal in combined with the advanced spectroscopy probes. So that's the end of my talk. So thank you everyone for listening. And yeah, questions, if there are more. Definitely, thank you. That was uh, uh, that was really fascinating. Um, uh, one question that came up had to do with uh, using temperature dependence of the sample in mm -hmm. XEOL. Can you yeah. talk about how that might uh, modify luminescence in a way that using the zeol could tell you more about microstructure? Uh, optical optical zeol. Uh, I I haven't done that. Um, personally, uh, but I think uh, if you manage to cool down, then uh, you're optimizing the uh, the resolution of the spectra because uh, you cool down the, the uh, remove the vibrational mode. So the you could you get you could get good XFs and uh, you can get maybe higher resolution zero. So I think it's uh, promising. Um, it's definitely worth trying. Uh, temperature dependence, you mean, yes? Temperature, yeah, uh, yeah, temperature, uh, I mean the going to the low temperature side. The going high to the low temperature, temperature yeah, side. Yeah. yeah. The higher temperature, uh, I'm not sure, might be doable, but I, I think it'll be trickier. Okay. Than low temperature. All right. Um, 
Uh, Yang Ha, would you like to ask a question? Oh, yeah. So I'm just uh, curious about the measuring conditions. So yes. you are basically collecting uh, photons at the UV visible range. So which means if you are measure, if you're excited at the hard X-ray, can you just measure it in in the atmosphere? Um, for uh, yes, yes. Okay. But for for hard X-ray, uh, my uh, the problem is that you might not the light emission usually weaker at hard X-ray. Okay. Okay. Uh, Jacinto, you have a question? Yeah. I, I, I mean, it's, it's a very nice talk, but I, I still have problems to understand how do you keep the elemental specificity uh, if, the, for example, the valence band is not dominated by that element? Because your example of the perovskites, right? Mm -hmm. yes. you have, if manganese doesn't contribute to that valence band, mm -hmm. how would you preserve the, your manganese specificity in that sense? So the uh, the manganese part is like uh, we're trying to when when sort of like know that uh, the core element two p electron cannot go directly into that dopant level, right? But uh, this zero just like to prove that when when the photon when most of the incoming photons are absorbed by manganese, and then if it is direct transition, then you will see a going up, a positive response. But instead you show uh, there's a negative response. So whatever that manganese transition is not, compared to the direct valence band transition, is not effective as yeah. the valence band direct excitation. So it's kind of like a support. But then it means that in a sense, the, the, for, the core, for the core hole to move all the way to the balance, that element has to be part of the balance. Mm -hmm. and otherwise, I mean, the, the core hole will never move there uh, uh, on the time scale that you put in this specific. Yeah, so that's why I see a drop. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, then I understand. Yeah, yeah that's why I see a drop. So yeah. We're hoping to see a drop and then there's a drop. So. Very good. Um... Uh, Matthew, did you have a follow-up question you wanted to ask? Well, I think you kind of answered it. Uh, I was asking about uh, the loss of site specificity because the, uh, the process is non-local. You know, you, you know, when you make the core hole, you kick out the uh, uh, Auger electrons and that causes a lot of stuff to happen far away. Mm -hmm. So uh, what is your question? And so I was wondering uh, just really how site specific it could be. And uh, you know, Jerry was saying that for hard x-rays, it's known that it could be non-local. Yeah, hard, that's, uh, hard x-ray, uh, the zeo is uh, usually quite weak. And uh, so, for, so because of this uh, electron, like uh, the, the hole going up, the whole, this whole process is not very effective at hard x-ray. So the zeo is actually more applied at soft X-ray. So you are you have more efficient, uh, more localized transition to promote this process. Right, but that wasn't really the question. The question was about the about how site specific it is, either hard or soft. Mm -hmm. Well, and you showed the example of the boron nitride, where it did seem to be site specific. Yes. So boron nitride is soft X-ray. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. How often, uh, I'll follow up on this, Matthew. Okay. Uh, how often do you try to do a, a zeal measurement with soft x-rays and end up concluding that your measurement is not local? Uh, Ligia, did you hear my question? Okay. Uh, pardon me, I was, oh, sorry, I was reading the, the comment, but anyway. Oh, no, no, please, please, that's, please, you, please, if you look please. at the chat, it gets too hard for the speaker. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I was asking, how often do you try a soft x-ray zeal measurement and then find out that um, uh, the result is non-local? Um, I would say 
uh, for some, so like for some samples, uh, like for like in certain edges that are, you can see, you can track it, but for some, you just don't see anything. Like you just see a flat. So, uh, so the chances are really uh, depending on the samples. Uh, 